do a quick quick run through of, of some of uh, my achievements, uh, or why you should take my advice uh, on, on how to prepare for tournaments. I have debated for a very long time. Um, I have been very bad at debating at, at points, uh, and then I think I've gotten better. And I think a, a lot of it is using tournaments, not just as uh, milestones or ways to test yourself, uh, but actually as an experience to grow uh, and to learn. I think th there's an enormous value in just doing a series of debates in a row with a particular team uh, in order to become uh, a better debater. So the way in which I thought we'd break down this discussion uh, is firstly chat uh, just about what you should do when you're selected into your team or after you've made your teams. Uh, different circuits have different norms about how you are put in your particular team. Some circuits allow you to choose. In New Zealand, it's almost an entirely a trial basis. Uh, so very little room for discretion. It is all decided uh, based on your performance uh, at trial and how they uh, fit you together. Um, then I'll, I'll talk to you about what you should be doing just in, in the long run to, to make yourself a, a, a better debater. Um, then secondly, how you uh, adjust it towards uh, being with a particular person uh, that you're speaking with. Uh, we'll have a little discussion about how to manage your workload. Uh, and then uh, in the days before the tournament, essentially what you should be doing uh, to put yourself in an appropriate headspace uh, to perform well at that tournament. Um, but before that, a little bit about me. Uh, so as I said, I'm a debater from New Zealand. Um, I was the chief adjudicator of Uhuru Worlds, which happened uh, over uh, the the uh, Christmas, uh, New Year's uh, holidays uh, very recently. Um, I was a top 10 speaker uh, at Austral's. Uh, I was grand finalist of MIDP um, and I was uh, the best speaker of Sydney Mini this year. Uh, so this, this will also be particularly, uh, there's some specific BP advice in this. Uh, I know most people uh, do BP, uh, but also going through to Austral's, uh, working with that two teammate uh, dynamic, uh, also going to do a little bit of discussion around, around that. So first things first, what do you do the moment you're selected uh, into, into a team with a particular person, or you decide and, and you agree with someone uh, that you are going to be debating together at a particular tournament. Uh, so obviously I think it's important to speak, communicate very openly and very clearly uh, about what you want to, uh, out of the tournament, how you want to engage it, get their vibe about things, realize that you're likely not gonna get absolutely everything uh, you want in, in those discussions. Being part of a team and being a good teammate uh, is, is about ebb and flow, uh, about making sure that you're doing something that is mutually productive for both of you, that that's how you get people uh, engaged uh, and, and working towards uh, the same goal as you. Um, and so not having that discussion in a particular aggressive way, but just uh, being very clear about what should our training schedule look like? Well, what do you want to achieve out of the tournament? Those types of questions are good to do just with your team rather than uh, as an individual approach um, uh, and, and help you set that, set that baseline. The second thing that you need to do with your teammate uh, is, is normally I'll just do a, a couple of relatively ordinary debates with them uh, in order to just gauge out what are people's particular strengths, what are people's particular weaknesses, how should you be working together uh, in a particular team. Uh, and I generally start uh, by doing practice preps with an individual, I think, uh, or, or, or two teammates. I think prepping uh, is the is the baseline of, of uh, good performance, uh, and you need to have very clearly established roles and dynamics within prep, uh, which comes from just doing a lot of preps within with an individual or with a team. So um, I'll do several preps uh, over a particular day or a particular evening, so that you can start finding that that appropriate dynamic. Get the first speaker to give their first speech, because all the way up until the end of your first speaker's first speech is really a team effort. Uh, and, and that's where the team needs to be clicking together, particularly uh, appropriately. I think then once you do more debating with, with particular groups or, or with an individual, you start learning the things that they do well, you start learning the things uh, that they need you to cover for them for. Uh, and so those two things end up blending in a way that I think is quite useful uh, into the long run. I would advise against over-practicing. And I think this is something that some people, uh, well, over-practicing in a particular way. I think there's a limited usefulness to just doing a billion debates with an individual. Debates are, are often their own creatures. They, they operate uh, under their own unique circumstances and unique particularities. Uh, and, and so just doing heaps and heaps of debates with people is not necessarily the best way uh, to, to learn how to gel as a team and, and can sometimes run the risk uh, of, of ossifying uh, particular habits that you may have that, that, that hold back the team. So often I, I structure then my lead up to the tournament into particular areas and then structure my training all along those areas. So in that early section, it's really about developing a healthy prep routine, getting the, the prep dynamic working appropriately uh, and, and making sure that uh, when you are developing those cases, you're doing it in a way that 
you're having appropriate give and take uh, and everything's working efficiently just so you can give the most, the best case that you can possibly give uh, in that half an hour or in that 15 minutes. So the first uh, section of my training uh, is always about how do I prep well with that, with that individual. Then uh, within the weeks, often you'll have uh, weekend tournaments these are once again uh, extremely useful uh, when you're training for like a big tournament or a major because it's, a, it's an opportunity to have a, a set of debates to see the progress that you have made uh, and then at the end have a have a recap uh, and, a, and a rethink about what worked uh, and what didn't work. Um, I, I think it's very easy when you're just doing lots and lots of debates in a row constantly to not have that peaking dynamic uh, in your training. You want to have several peaks in your training because what happens when you get to the, the top of a peak uh, with a particular team or with a, with a teammate um, is it gives you a moment to really be critical about how the performance has gone, uh, to set yourself a, a set of goals for the next peak that you want to do. I, I want our preps to be more appropriate. I want um, uh, to, to have the extension that comes out at second uh, to, to be more clear uh, and aggressive in extending what we have within this debate. Um, so setting up those peaks within your training routine uh, is very important. And then before the tournament uh, with your teammates, uh, I think it's good just to do stuff that helps put you collectively uh, in a mind frame. So um, before every debate that we did at Austral's, my, my team would meditate together. Uh, we would go have dinner together. We would do things that, that um, meant that, that when you get to that tournament environment uh, and you're stressed and you're exhausted and you have like low tolerance for, for people's uh, annoying habits um, and inabilities, uh, you just have something you can breathe and, and sit back on and reestablish a bit of center. Remind yourself that hopefully the people you're debating with uh, are your friends first um, and your debating partners second. Uh, just gives you that little bit of room to, 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 to breathe. Does anyone have any questions about managing things like team dynamics, what you should be doing uh, when, you, when you're working uh, with a particular group of individuals uh, in the lead up for the tournament? Uh, and if not, happy to jump into talking about what you can do as an individual and what you should be doing in general uh, to, to make sure that when you're performing, uh, you're performing particularly well at tournaments. What have you done of a consistent teammate? Oh la la, that is... Um, Classic. Uh, I, I have had several inconsistent teammates uh, in the past. So inconsistent can mean multiple things. So I'm just going to go through the different uh, what, what the, that, that question could be implying. So some people are inconsistent uh, in that they just have a different expectation uh, out of the tournament than you do. They might not want to train as hard as you. They um, might not uh, vibe with the with with the dynamic that, that's being created. Uh, and in that case there is exceptionally little you can do. Uh, you just need to think of the tournament uh, as a learning experience. Often you will work with, with people who are difficult or people who have different expectations uh, going into things. Uh, and so hold on, try and enjoy the ride. You simply cannot change people's uh, mindsets as much as you want. Though you being clear about what you want is the most likely thing uh, that'll help generate their consistency. Setting stuff like clear boundaries about practice, uh, getting them to pre-commit to stuff, um, but then again, if they're not following through on those commitments, it's, there's, there's very little you can do. So just don't let it ruin your experience of debating. Try and enjoy it for what it is uh, and recognize that it's going to be a learning experience. I think uh, another way in which that question could be interpreted is what if you don't have a teammate who is uh, consistent uh, in their approach to debating? I have also had teammates like that. Uh, and I think that honestly, Debating with those people has probably made me much better at debating than if I was debating with someone who is hyper predictable. I always knew what they were going to do um, and developed because one of the incredibly important skills about debating uh, is flexibility. Uh, and I think this is really the core of why I advise you not to just do a billion practice debates one after the other uh, or ossify yourself into particular ways of doing things or trying to like figure out this is the approach um, because different things will, will, will demand uh, difference of you. Um, and you need to be able to train up your individual ability to adapt to circumstances, but also do that on a team-wide level where you're not looking for a finished product each time you reach a peak. It is like, how are we going to be able to adjust what we're doing? Uh, and then to try that out and see if it's working uh, in order to drive, drive the team forward. Um, and so that's just what happens if they're inconsistent debating. Just be flexible. Um, try and try and listen, always listen to them while they're speaking. Uh, try and figure out what they're doing uh, and then couch your case and your language uh, in, in terms of what uh, you, you think will fill those gaps. Um, and you will just miss prep a couple of times with great teammates who are highly consistent and you will need those skills of flexibility uh, there. I think the final way to interpret uh, that question uh, is to have a, a, a teammate that is sometimes very good and sometimes not so good. Uh, and I think you have a responsibility uh, 
twofold uh, as, as a teammate. Uh, the first is just obviously to try and do well, to try and cover their mistakes, try and prop them up, um, because them doing well in that particular debate obviously helps you do well. Uh, but, but I don't think people particularly need to be reminded that what you need to do there is just to be as flexible as possible, try and repair things. The second thing is to note that consistency can become more. People don't uh, exist with a, a fixed level of consistency. And many people, especially in the run-up to the tournament, uh, will be inconsistent in how they perform. Uh, and then when they get to the tournament, are able to be much more consistent because of the work you've done, building up their confidence, building up their uh, their uh, skills so that they know that they've got something to fall back on, making sure that they understand that if they do mess things up, you'll be there to back it up, to take some of the pressure uh, off them. Uh, and you can improve your teammates uh, enormously just by being understanding, especially during training or especially in, in lead up tournaments, if they're trying like hard, but just mis-execute something, recognize that there's an experimentation that is happening there that often does fade. Uh, people just become, I, I think, much more consistent when they actually uh, reach tournaments. Um, there was a tournament before Austral's where uh, me and my second speaker had a habit of giving like three minute introductions and it drove our first speaker crazy. Um, but I think the good thing is that we got it out of our system. Uh, and then when we went to the actual tournament, uh, it was significantly uh, easier to, to pair that back and to deliver consistent uh, performances. Uh, but that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any, any other questions? Uh, and you can unmute or, or send through uh, a message via the chat. Nope, let's have a chat about um, then what you should be doing uh, as an individual to prepare yourself for the tournament. I think that people massively underestimate uh, the, the impact that individual practice and individual training uh, can have on your just, just uh, ability in debating. Um, and so what I'll break this down into is, is two parts. Firstly, what you should be doing as part of like a daily routine. Uh, and secondly, what you should be doing uh, as part of just like individual practice or individual training where, where you'll sit down and be like, I'm gonna spend the next hour becoming a better debater. So the things that you should be doing in general uh, is having a good media diet. Um, and I think what many people misunderstand is I've never made a matter file. I'll, I'll be very honest. There is no way on earth I'm going to sit down and write everything that has happened in the world. That just seems wildly unrealistic to me uh, about the amount of things that you will be able to put down onto paper relative to the amount of effort uh, that you'll end up um, putting in. I think it can be useful at the beginning of your debating career because putting in that particular amount of effort to learning a couple of topics really well then gives you a framework for understanding different topics and you end up come to export it. Uh, but once you've reached a certain critical mass of understanding things, I don't make particular matter files. What I do do, um, is firstly, uh, I make sure that you read very widely. So mm -hmm. spending time looking at, at several different news sources. For example, I, I read The Atlantic. Um, I'll read uh, Council on Foreign Relations. So there's a few uh, media sites that I think are quite good. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts on, on a variety of topics, and I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Often I'll just delete uh, heaps and heaps and heaps of them from my feed. But even just reading through those headlines gives you that general broad base understanding of what is happening in the world, uh, what is the pulse um, of, of things that are going on. And then if there are particular issues uh, that I think are interesting, I will spend five, 10 minutes at the most, unless I find a great article that I want to read, uh, just teaching myself about that particular topic. So say uh, my teammate is like, Daniel, we need to learn about FTCs. And I'm like, I don't know what FTCs are. They are some complicated financial thing um, that I don't particularly understand. Uh, spend five to 10, 15 minutes uh, reading through the Wikipedia page. Having that collated document, the, the document itself is not the thing that, that helps you. Having the consistent habits and uh, listening to a broad range of things, reading a broad range of things, uh, getting the headlines in a very consistent way. That's why I find podcasts very useful because I'll just delete headlines and be like, wow, immigration in terms of, um, I don't know, uh, flow from Mexico to Texas is particularly in, in the American news uh, at a large uh, tournament like, like Worlds. It potentially has the capacity to come up. Maybe I'll spend some time reading about that, but at least it's there. It's in my mind. I can start mulling it over. And, and you're kind of like on the pulse for what is happening uh, within the world. Uh, and if you find it helpful to make a long list, often I'll have a list of um, but before tournaments or with, with a general squad. What I'll do is I'll, uh, across the entire squad, have a Google Doc where people can contribute topic ideas. It's not a matter file in that it explains things or explains point. It's just a topic like automation in 
the grocery industry, if that's something that is particularly uh, big at, at the time. Uh, and even through that, it, it can be really helpful just to read through the list of what other people are appreciating is in the news. Uh, and then if something strikes you as something that you just have no understanding of, uh, you can just learn what those words are, get that baseline appreciation, because that's where like the 80% of the gain that you'll make in debating is from. It's from that broad-based understanding. And if you're spending heaps of time specializing on a small number of those topics, you might gain the extra 20%, but you're losing the 80% in other things. And I think just the solution is to have a, a varied media diet, making sure you're consuming uh, lots of different news. The second thing I do um, when I'm doing individual training uh, is you, you're supposed to, you should do things that are designed to build up individual skills as a debater, rather than the skills that you roll out uh, in, a, in a team debate uh, or in um, really in like a re responsive uh, setting, which will often be why it's quite difficult to train as a second or a third speaker by yourself. Um, and the one thing that I found most useful uh, in, in developing uh, as, a, as a debater is giving speeches in which you haven't written any notes. Uh, what this does, it, I kind of think of it like the weightlifting uh, of debating. It's designed to just increase your capacity to flexibly structure arguments uh, and then, then give those arguments um, in a way that is going to be unfluid and it's going to be messy and it's going to be ugly. I think that's the biggest thing for me. It's much harder to give beautiful speeches when you are uh, giving them with no notes. But it really does, I think, train you on the very core skills that are necessary uh, to be a successful, flexible debater. Uh, and that's your ability to up on the fly, inject structure into arguments, being able to hold the four sub points of your argument in your head uh, and then walk through them one uh, after the other, even if you've got like nothing written down on your piece of paper uh, and inject the level of detail and structure that is necessary uh, to perform just very well when you won't have enough time to, 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 to set that all down um, on paper. So I do a lot of no notes uh, speeches uh, in the run up to the run up to a tournament because it, it gets your brain really firing in a way that most other debating uh, doesn't. Uh, and often I'll just like invent opposition rebuttal points. So I'll, I'll give my third speech um, where I have like the, the points of clash that I think are relevant to the debate. Uh, and I'll make it my job with, with a couple of, these are what I think the obvious weaknesses of the points are. Um, just pretending uh, as though they've made those points and attending to flip that analysis or, uh, or beat it. And yes, it, it like, really is quite painful having the, uh, the, the no notes speech environment, both because a lot of mental effort uh, and because it, it doesn't feel nearly as fluid and fun uh, as giving a speech that is uh, pre-scripted, pre-prepared, but unlike anything else, it'll improve you. Uh, and I think that links into the last bit of feedback I'll give about individual, what you should be doing by yourself. Um, and it is most unpleasant when you do it uh, in relation to your no notes speeches. You should have a routine of recording, re-listening and then repeating. Uh, and what I mean by that is every single speech I give, uh, I have two from this evening when I had some world's practices, um, you should record it, listen to it again. Often I listen to it uh, on my walk home. So I give yourself a little bit of time uh, and then listen and be like, ah, oh, I think I did my, that the thing particularly well. Oh, I don't think I did that uh, exceptionally. Um, and then repeat the speech, essentially fresh, write some fresh notes or, or, or no notes uh, if, if you're wanting to give a no note speech. Um, and then give the speech again, improving on the things that you will improve. And sometimes your second speech will be worse than your first speech. Um, and you'll just learn from that. There's, no, there's nothing wrong from that because it's all about identifying the things that have gone well or gone poorly or the challenges that, that strike you in particular speeches. Uh, and then being able to basically rewalk through those patterns uh, in a way that cements those lessons. Um, so it cements those lessons in your brain. Uh, and, and so often I'll, give a no note speech, uh, re-listen to it after I've, I've recorded it, um, give, a, give, give a, another version of it later, um, and, and then re-listen to that. Uh, and they'll, they'll both be deeply ugly speeches uh, because when you have no notes, you're constantly reaching for words and then you're trying to inject structure, um, but it really helps you boil down what are the key bits of your speeches that are working well or not working well, um, uh, and how should you be adjusting them or what are the progress that you're making? I also think it's quite nice because then uh, at the end of a tournament, so I record all of my speeches uh, across a tournament as well and give myself some time to listen to them uh, in the break between rounds. Uh, you have some very nice then memories that you can then take from it. Uh, and I think it's nice to build up uh, essentially a little library of speeches in which you just think like, wow, I did a banger job on that speech. That was fantastic. Um, where you did the things that you've been uh, practicing towards. And so you have that positive uh, 
like very tangible reminder of what your speeches can be. Uh, and then you can use that as a template. You can use that as uh, even just as inspiration uh, for speeches going forward. Or after you give a disaster speech, like uh, as a reminder that, that there are things that you, you can do well uh, and listen to the, the disaster speech, identify what went wrong with the disaster speech. Uh, and then, then just remind yourself that you are very capable of giving excellent speeches um, uh, and that there, there's more stuff to strive for. Does anyone have any questions about um, that individual side uh, of practice or how people should be putting together um, their practices? Are people interested in hearing some more drills or like the, the small individual things you can do? No notes are my favorite ones, but they're like other drills that, that might be uh, fun to chat about in terms of how you can like just develop those skills by yourself. Neat. Okay, we'll have a little bit of a chat. Um, I think two exercises uh, are particularly useful. Uh, one of them relies on repetition uh, and one of them relies on essentially attempting to deepen and structure things. So one of them is essentially like, it's, it's, a, it's a rebuttal exercise or a rebuttal game. Um, uh, and, and essentially what you do is you come up with a particular point um, and then essentially, give a responsive level to that, a responsive argument to that point that holds yourself to particular ways in which points can be beaten. So one thing you should do is you should sit down and think what are all of the different ways in which a point can be wrong? So a point can be wrong because the logic of it doesn't work or it's misapplied or they missed something about the context or they've made a factual assertion that is unclear or they haven't impacted appropriately or they haven't done the framework uh, nicely. There's a whole bunch of reasons why points can be broken. Uh, and essentially what you then do is you take this point that you've built in your head uh, and essentially try and figure out all of the ways in which the point is wrong. Uh, and then the second thing I do is try and figure out all the ways in why the point is not just wrong, it operates in the opposite direction. This is a skill I think is really important in debating. You should be overreaching with your rebuttal essentially. It's not just about wiping a point off the board. You should be attempting to flip a point and, and to win that point. Uh, and, and often what you'll find yourself doing there is giving like slightly implausible uh, speeches where something is very like a very obvious point uh, and doing literally everything you can to, to flip that point. And I think what that teaches you if you, if you do it mechanistically and you do it um, over, over a couple of trainings just by yourself, come up with a bunch of points or even like a point that you had made in a previous speech, flipping then and just systematically being like, how are all, here are all the ways in which a point can go wrong. I'm going to apply that as fast as I can to that and then, then give that rebuttal point. That just means that when you're in a debate and rebuttal being the part of a speech that you have the least amount of time and preparation for, that's when you if, you, if you do that a lot by yourself, you'll be most comfortable then rolling it out within a debate, having those baseline concepts of what am I looking for that can be wrong in the back of your head. Uh, and then also sometimes it's fun, say for example, you're training with a teammate who is somewhere else. So they're doing their own individual training. You can record yourself giving a point, maybe using the other uh, drill uh, that I've done um, and essentially just use that as your model for how am I going to break this point. Um, so the second game I, I like to play uh, is about, I'm not quite sure how to say this. A lot of debating is, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that happens in debating that fills the speeches. And then there are the connectors between those little things. And I like to think of it as like professional swimmers when they are swimming a lap will reach the end of the lane and then will have an incredibly polished and neat way of swinging around and then going in the opposite direction or moving on to the next point or the next thing that needs to be accomplished. Um, and I think there are parts of speeches which essentially can be uh, removed and isolated and practiced like, like, like was done with the rebuttal point uh, in a way that allows you to build your smoothness and fluency going between points or doing the basics of a speech in a very clean and nice way. The things that I particularly do is I do introductions, uh, and, what, and what I try and achieve with all of my introductions is my introductions are essentially just a reflection of my case. Uh, I explain what we have done in this case that means we have won the debate, and then I'll explain what in the case then increases the margin or, or means that, that we win by more. And I'll do this after I've given some practice speech, recorded or listened, uh, and just practice that introduction and getting as cleanly as possible, what do we need to do to win the debate? What do we need to win this debate by a larger margin? and then having those themes come across very crisply uh, in an introduction. 
Uh, and then secondly, you can even apply those to points themselves. Uh, often people will meander through points without having a clear victory, uh, a, a clear vision of judge. If I prove this and I prove this, this necessarily follows and you care about it for this reason. Having that little bit at the beginning of your points is actually a really good way of making sure the point is cohesive. You have that chain very clearly for the judge. They know what, what you're going to be doing. Um, and so if I've done a practice speech, I'll just repeat in shorter and shorter increments, give yourself 30 seconds, then 25 seconds, then 20 seconds, um, repeating that to win this point, we, we want to achieve this with this point. Uh, to do that, we've proven this, this, and this, uh, and this is why you should care about that point. And you do that all in 30 seconds, then 25 seconds, then 20 seconds, 15 seconds, uh, all to increase your efficiency within debating. Debating is just an efficiency game. It's um, how can I take ideas that are heavily complex um, and clashing in awkward ways, uh, going far beyond uh, teams in a debate where two very smart groups of people are smashing against each other aggressively, that produces complexity that is um, far in excess of what our brains are capable of dealing with. There are so many options for how a debate will unfold in Austral's, and then you increase that by a factor of 10 when you add extensions from BP. Um, it's just extraordinarily complicated. Um, and so what this does is it forces you to uh, impose that discipline on the way you are speaking uh, to make sure you can get through those complicated ideas in clean, crisp, efficient ways. Uh, so you can just put more things on the table that stick uh, and, and then be able to tie them together in ways that are neat. So doing that with your introductions for a case, doing that with your uh, introductions to your points for when you're setting out, what do I need to do with this point in order to win adjudicator? What do I need to convince you of? Um, uh, and then obviously doing it with your rebuttal uh, as in, in, in the other exercise. Um, and often I'll do that with my signposting as well. So my signposting kind of folds into my introductions. So I'll be like, I'll win the debate by doing this, my first point, and I'll do uh, increase margin by doing this, my second point. Um, uh, and, the, and, the reason, and the relationship between these points is, is blah, 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 blah. This is why I've asserted uh, the value judgments I've made uh, or the strategic judgments, the pathway to victory that I've painted to the judge uh, in the beginning of my speech. Uh, and just being very clean about that is something you can actually practice. Getting the, how do I sum up this debate in as few words as possible so the judge knows exactly what I need to do and need to prove, imposes that discipline on your brain. And also then means when you understand the debate to that level, you're able to then uh, explain that to the judge in a clear way. Anyone have any questions about uh, individual training or any of the exercises uh, that I've chatted about? Nope, no questions, awesome. So last thing we'll talk about then uh, is essentially you're in the week before the tournament, how should you be approaching it? I cannot stress this enough. Do not over practice in the week before the tournament. You don't want to be uh, heading into what is essentially a gargantuan effort, um, doing the eight, nine debates or however many debates uh, and having done a whole bunch of debates just before that, that is something that'll just exhaust you. It'll burn you out. Uh, it'll leave you unable to, to perform as well as you want at the tournament. Uh, so it's very important to keep that sense of balance to make sure that you are not taking too much of yourself before a tournament that you will have nothing left uh, to give. It's still important to keep fresh. I will give um, in, in the week before a tournament, maybe a, a no note speech every day, uh, just in order to keep the things ticking along, uh, to keep that fluency uh, and, and fluidity. Um, when you uh, are interested in looking after yourself, that needs to extend beyond your approach uh, just to debating uh, and not, not over-practicing uh, in, that, in that week beforehand. Stuff like drinking enough water, not exposing yourself to, to viruses so that you don't get a cold um, or, or whatever worse may exist, uh, making sure that you get adequate sleep. Dear God, I'm, I'm going to struggle enormously at Worlds where uh, I have to wake up at, well, I have to be awake at, at 10 p.m. and then debate until 4, 5 a.m. It's going to be a huge struggle. And part of the way that I'm going to deal with that is adjusting my sleep schedule little by little up until the tournament uh, and, and then making sure that I still get eight, nine hours sleep uh, at the tournament, those are just incredibly important habits to maintain. Um, eating both before the tournament and during the tournament, I think I am a classic example of someone who uh, finds it very easy to, to uh, deprioritize uh, just like nutrition and making sure that I'm well fed across the tournament to detrimental effects. Like I obviously, I, I just like factually debate worse uh, when, I'm, when I'm not ensuring that I have 
stable supplies of meals. And I think that's particularly true for tournaments where you've gone overseas uh, and you have no access to ordinary supplies of food. It's probably a little bit more easy in the online era uh, to ensure that you are just getting that, that, that those, those basics in a way that is important. But if you just don't do those things and it's so easy to dismiss the sleep and the eating uh, and actually the exercise, do go get exercise, walk outside um, if, if, if possible. Um, they just massively improve your mood during the tournament, which means that then you're less snappy or teammates, the team dynamic can operate better. It also just puts your mind uh, just on an unparalleled level of, of readiness for the actual tournament. So look after yourself uh, in that upcoming week. And that obviously extends to also how the tournament operates uh, as well. So if I speak first at a tournament, uh, at the beginning of the day, often I will give a uh, practice speech. Uh, it'll normally be shorter than an ordinary speech, really just to shake off the rust uh, of the new day, but you don't want to be over overloading yourself or overwhelming yourself uh, in the run up uh, to that tournament um, uh, and just getting essentially a back in the flow for, for a particular day. Um, I make sure that I keep my mental hygiene quite good. So I no longer listen to extraneous media during tournaments. So I'll stop listening to podcasts. So I basically stop reading the news because uh, you just want to keep your mind fresh not overwhelmed by constant stimulation. Debates are extraordinarily stimulating and it's very easy to just allow your brain to continue to spool onwards or spiral outwards after the debate is finished when really what you need to be doing is unspooling it and re relaxing. Um, and so find things that you find help you with that often as just like sitting with people um, or chatting or not doing anything too, too mentally strenuous. Like, playing cards is like a fun thing to do um, between rounds uh, and also just keeps your mind off of the stress of the tournament and managing stress is also another thing uh, that's particularly important but just made way easier if you put yourself uh, in, in a position to to not be stressed i like to uh, meditate before each round uh, because i think 10 minutes of attempting to just put yourself in, in a space where you are focused uh, and concentrated and not overwhelmed, just in control, uh, is, is very important for the mindset going into the round and going into prep. If you amp yourself up before the prep and then suddenly jump into prep, and then you do that nine times over the course of the tournament, your nerves will just be shot. So you will be, uh, it, it'll, it'll just be deeply, deeply more exhausting than it needs to be. Um, so it's good to give yourself that space before a round just to let yourself decompress, get in the right headspace, get in the zone. Um, uh, and then after the speeches, uh, after after the debates, I'll do two things. Firstly, I have a little booklet uh, and I write all of the feedback that I'm given there. And then at the end of the day or at the end of a little peak, so say I've done another practice tournament in the week before, um, I'll, I'll collate that feedback and try and synthesize it. What are the couple of things, the themes in this in this feedback, uh, stuff that I can do? And I also do that during a, a tournament for two reasons. One, it really sucks to be like, they gave me feedback and I can't quite remember what it is, but I feel like it is desperately essential uh, in how I approach the next debate. It's good to have that. So your overtired brain is not bearing the brunt of, of needing to remember every single thing, but it is also good because you can write it down and then you can close the book. Um, it is important not to get overly preoccupied um, at debating tournaments with, with the round before. Uh, it's very easy to overcorrect or to over adjust or to lose perspective within the essentially like washing machine that is a that is a tournament. So having that ability to structure your thoughts, put it down and then put it away, uh, I find very useful for keeping on top of the feedback. Um, and then uh, this is a bonus, depending on how, how much your brain likes the stress, I will tend to listen to my speeches. Um, about an hour after the round happens. So I've decompressed, I've let myself breathe. I can go listen to my speech with a, with a no, not critical, but a, um, just, just a open uh, appraisal of, of what went well, what didn't, what, what didn't go well. Um, and that also will hopefully make the feedback that you've received from the adjudicator just a lot more clear um, in, in the way that you then approach it. Um, I also think finally, it's important to have decent expectations and to understand that those expectations will be dashed. They just will. Worlds last year was one of the most painful experiences uh, of my life. Uh, at the end of day two, we were in the nine top teams uh, and then had a disaster day three where we crashed out of the tournament. That happens. It, it just does. There's nothing you can really do. Um, I think we've gotten our head a little bit at day three didn't have our processes of just decompressing. Uh, and and so, so being able to bounce back from that stuff comes from how you approach uh, your tournaments as well in the prep phase, making sure that you're not 
overblowing uh, how important this particular event is, thinking of even of the major large tournaments uh, as just steps within, within your debating journey as part of a, a greater trajectory uh, of how you're developing as a speaker, um, just does wonders for your mental health. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. Okay, question. During most debates, we give speeches that are inconsistent. Sometimes we give an 80 and then immediately we give a 73. How can we be more consistent with our speeches? Excellent question. Uh, so it depends what you mean by, it, well, firstly, it just comes from identifying what the cause of your inconsistency is. Some teams have incredible preps and then dysfunctional preps, and that'll be the cause of their inconsistency uh, as a team, because obviously if you have a bad prep, everything falls to pieces. So with that particular team, it's about building your prep routine. Uh, if, if you're struggling with like a clash of roles or people not feeling where they really fit in that prep, discuss those roles. Say, you need to do X, Y, and Z thing, and I'll do X, Y, and Z thing. Does that work for you? Yes, no? Okay, we'll adjust those roles a little bit. But people just need to be clear uh, um, and come to an agreement about what, what particular roles are going to be in prep in order to then have consistent preps, which then generate consistent outcomes. Sometimes your speeches uh, will be inconsistent or consistent, depending on how well you've predicted the debate. Um, so if you have a perfectly clashing speech where you've appropriately predicted what, what the NAG or what the CO is going to run, um, You'll give great speeches, but then you'll be unable to adjust if they do something that is uh, surprising. Uh, and the skill there that you just build is your no note speeches uh, and your rebuttal sessions and your practicing sessions. So everything that needs to operate in the background can just operate in the background and you can give a not particularly well thought out speech in a very polished, nice way so that you don't feel like you're uh, on, the, on the back foot, uh, but also having that, that mental capacity to shift and be flexible uh, in order to paper over the cracks. I think those individual practices um, and, and those individual drills you can do really do help build your consistency because they force you essentially uh, to think about things when they aren't going well or you aren't in the perfect environment where you don't have any notes in front of you um, uh, and then encourage you to try and come with those appropriate outcomes. Uh, and then finally, obviously, you can do well at debates because you um, don't know anything about them. Having that broad uh, media diet uh, is quite important uh, in, in order uh, to, build, uh, to build stuff up. The last little bit of feedback that uh, I think is important just to increasing your consistency is about how you build then feedback uh, into your uh, loop um, where you understand what's happening. It's very easy to be like uh, to, to uh, approach debating in a way that isn't sensitive to what is actually going on. Because just give a speech, then it ends, then you give some feedback, and you forget about it. And like, like, so that it, it's very easy to allow those problems to fester and then just be surprised when they emerge again. Having those clear processes of what do I do when I receive feedback? I write it in my little book. Uh, what do I uh, do after a speech so that I, I make sure that I'm understanding what actually happened in my speech, re-listening to your speeches, repeating your speeches. These are the ways that you end up identifying the things that don't go well in your speeches uh, and improving them. And, and it's literally worked wonders for me. I very consistently have a habit in out rounds of becoming overly flowery and overly slow uh, and not addressing the crux of the debate. It is a predictable pattern that happens to me uh, in first out rounds. It only became apparent to me because I started taking like a lot of notes um, and uh, realizing, wow, quarterfinals, octofinals, Daniel consistently just bottling it. Uh, and then identifying the particular way that I was bottling it, uh, recognizing that it's a mindset thing. It's the fact that suddenly an audience is there, throws me off in that little microsecond as to how I approach things. Um, and then, then being able uh, to fix it. So it, it really, really is, wonderfully helpful to put those things down on paper in front of you uh, and then then build from there. Yeah. Neat. Next question. How do you listen to or process the oral adjudications of ADGES? Sometimes well and sometimes poorly. So the way that I should do it, uh, and, and very often I'll do it, sometimes, sometimes you just get an outrageous decision. We all know the feeling of getting a truly outrageous decision. And sometimes it's much more difficult to listen. So holding your teammates to account to listening uh, is, is quite important. And sometimes when you've won a debate by a lot and you know you've won a debate by a lot, uh, it's easy just to tune out uh, and not listen. I do a lot of things to force my just generally like human undisciplined brain into doing actual work during both debates and during oral adjudications. So as a third speaker and a whip, I write a lot of notes based on other people's speeches that I'm never going to take up with me. So I write just as if I was adding the debate, what the uh, prime minister says and what the, uh, what the leader of the opposition says in a BP debate or what the first speaker and the, and the uh, first neg say if I'm speaking third at Austral's just because it forces your brain to stay within the debate, to be doing something useful, even if you're speaking ages away. I think a similar process can be done to how you should approach our oral adjudications. So I'll have my little book in front of me um, when, when I hear uh, an OA, 
I'll listen to how they identify the pathways to victories for team. Team needs to do X in order to win. Once they've achieved X, anything above that is then increasing the margin or winning the debate more. Because that's a sense you actually get from listening to lots of adjudications, from writing out how those adjudications are structured. It's not, it's, it's a very unintuitive skill. Um, and it, it was one that you really get from having a judging background. And this is why I actually think being a judge and doing a lot of judging made me a much better uh, debater. So I'll have my book in front of me. I'll, I'll track what they're saying about the tipping points within the debate. Uh, and I'll be writing out before they even start giving me general feedback, where I think I could have had a little bit more of a role in that. So if they're like, I found the balance between this point and this point like this because of these factors, I'll know that I needed to do more on those factors to drive them in one direction uh, or another. So you start thinking about how you could have phrased your introduction, you could have phrased the, the structure you have within your points. This is where you can then go out, go away and, and, and do those uh, practice exercises that I was talking about uh, in order to win the debate and then in order to win the points. Um, uh, and then I always go for feedback. I think a it's disrespectful not to go for feedback that that person has spent time out of their i don't know if it's busy lives but time out of their lives listening to you uh at a random debating tournament they deserve your ear um uh they deserve to um feel like you respect the process even if you disagree with them uh, and remember you should debating is about winning bad judges and good judges so even if you think the debate the judge is a bad judge like they're giving you ideal insight into how you can win other judges in the future who will no doubt also um, be incorrect uh, and totally not listen to your uh, excellent second split uh, or whatever material you think was slighted uh, in that debate. Uh, so I always get personal feedback. Uh, I'll write it down. Um, the, the key points of it, don't write everything because sometimes stuff is just not particularly useful or you, or you disagree with it. I'll often write down feedback I disagree with, but I'll, I'll heavily caveat that, that I disagree with it. Um, and then after the oral adjudication, once again, it's that process of synthesizing and consolidating because it's easy to consider something in isolation uh, and then take the wrong lessons from it. But once you consider it in the scope of all the feedback you've got across the tournament or the last three practices uh, that you've done, it becomes much easier to identify how those patterns were playing out. Okay, so we've had a question about how uh, exercises that you can use uh, to improve essentially the depth of your analysis, um, and especially, especially to go deeper uh, in, a, in a BP motion, uh, well, in a BP debate. Uh, so firstly, I just say, once again, no note speeches are fantastic for improving the, the, the depth of the analysis that you bring. Uh, because when you, dear goodness, when you listen to that speech again, you will identify all the repetitions and all the things that you were redoing and uh, being inefficient about within your speech. Uh, and I think having that clarity that comes from doing a whole bunch of speeches where you have very little support uh, for, from your notes will just force you to improve that cognitive capacity uh, in terms of in terms of how the analysis works. Um, I, I think a point precedent to that is uh, just do a lot of judging and, and do a lot of judging of, of good debaters, because I think there is some osmosis that happens here from looking at how good debaters structure their analysis and structure their points. Um, and then try and break it down from a from a judging perspective. What is this doing to the mind of the judge? How are they taking me from point A to point B uh, and getting deeper? Uh, and so just doing that judging and doing that listing uh, increases stuff. The last thing I'd say is I push a lot to overreach points. So overreach is potentially the wrong word. I, I tend to flip material or not just explain why something is incorrect by why the exact opposite uh, happens. And I think you can do this as the same thing uh, in, in just your substantive analysis. What you will do is you'll explain the smallest possible benefit you can claim. Then what I do is I explain a slightly bigger one, maybe less implausible, slightly bigger one, slightly bigger one, slightly bigger one. And then at some point the judge will be like, oh, I don't buy it anymore. Um, not gonna accept the last reach part that you had. Uh, but telling that story of how, uh, towards the, the the most ambitious version of the point from the least ambitious version of the point, make sure that you are consistent, make sure that uh, the point deepens and goes more naturally deep, and also make sure that if the judge doesn't accept something you say, not all of your material is thrown away, they just draw it to the line of what they think you are able to prove. So I often use that sliding mechanism of least ambitious uh, version of the point to most ambitious version of the point, uh, and that definitely deepens the analysis that you are able uh, able to bring. If anyone has more specific questions about uh, the depth of points, feel free to feel free to send a message. Do you think it's more effective to focus on one drill per day or lots of small drills per day to practice? 
wow, that's a lot of practice. I don't even do daily practice. Uh, I think what's important to do is maybe twice, three times a week, sit down for a couple of hours uh, and then essentially just do uh, a, a mental mental workout. Uh, a lot of the smaller stuff you're doing, like the, the, the small things that you do to improve your debating should be about increasing your exposure to information. So listening to podcasts or, or reading stuff and that stuff you can exit or listening to stuff. So often I'll like, before 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 a big tournament, I'm like walking to work or something. Uh, I'll listen to two or three speeches that I gave from the tournament before, one after the other, just so that once again you get that um, you get inculcated in your in your own rhythm and your own way of saying things. It, it deepens uh, your your understanding of what you are doing. You think about the things that you did well uh, or you did poorly, um, and then you deepen your understanding of what you do in debates and, and what needs to change. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't uh, do one drill today or even just like lots of little drills uh, across a day. What you should do is pick a particular time frame, maybe with a teammate. So it's like nice to do solo practice with a teammate or practice preps because prepping is just exceptionally, exceptionally important uh, to how you approach a tournament. Um, and then have that two, three hour workout and then close the book, close your mind, think about other things, have a laugh outside of debating. Uh, it, it's very important to have that balance in the way you approach things. Otherwise debating will just consume all of your spare brain power. Um, uh, and, and that'll just make you a worse debater. So, so often what happens to me, especially when I was younger at tournaments, uh, it's just because you do so many debates in a row uh, and you think so much about debating, talk about so much debating, I find it very hard to turn my brain off. Um, and that makes it very difficult for me to sleep. It makes it very difficult for me to essentially just re relax and let go. Uh, and, and sometimes the, the all encompassing approach to training with debating actually teaches you a bad habit in not practicing that muscle that is relaxing. Uh, and letting go of, of what you are doing uh, and then saying, I'll be able to pick this up because I've got my book, I've got my structure when it comes up again, but for now I'm able to move on uh, and, and do something else uh, and, and not think about debating. Uh, yeah, so so don't take that all-encompassing approach. Itemize it, isolate it, listen to stuff you find interesting, important. Neat, any more questions? I love tournaments. I also think that's something that's massively under discussed in debating. Like sometimes we're a bit like, potentially like a little bit uh, cynical and, and mean about, about debating. Um, debating is, a, is an activity that adds extraordinary richness uh, to all of our lives. Um, and it becomes richer, the healthier your mindset comes. Um, and so you can get into this incredible virtuous circle where you go to tournaments that make you happy and then that increases the positivity uh, of your approach. Um, and, and you should be looking to tournaments uh, as, a, as a source of, of joy. Um, and though they are a source of anxiety, thinking about them, uh, thinking about your relationship with tournaments in a way is how can I make this a positive experience? How can I make the changes necessary uh, to like debating? Because um, I think it'd be an incredible shame if everyone was much better at debating, but enjoyed it a lot less. Uh, and so try and find the things that make debating like wonderful to you. Uh, yeah, and I think also the things that make you feel good about debating. And that's like one of the really nice things about recording all of your speeches. You can just be like, oh, I gave such a good speech in round three of Austral's 2015 or something. Oh, wow, so showing my age, long time ago. Um, I wish I had recorded that speech because it really was an exceptional speech. Um, uh, and, and you get to remind yourself of, here's something fun that, that, that we did. Here was a debate that we were great in. Um, yeah, so reminding yourself of that is really nice and just important to your approach to tournaments. Um, and also, sorry, there's also something that needs to be established like culturally. You as an individual cannot unilaterally do the things that make debating a healthier activity. Uh, so discuss it within your clubs, appoint people within your clubs who are specifically in charge of making sure that it is a pleasant activity for the people uh, who are uh, involved in it, that they feel supported, that they have people to chat to, that they have mentorship. Um, all of the excellent things that I'm sure most of your societies are doing, but they are like a unique approach at tournaments. And I, actually, I think just in general with your squads, one thing that we found very use, uh, useful recently uh, is we appoint equity officers within the particular squad so that they're people who you can chat to if you're, if you're struggling with anything. Uh, we make sure that teams are assigned particular mentors and often will be like Auckland One mentoring, the three members of Auckland One uh, will be mentoring Auckland 4, Auckland 5, Auckland 6, uh, or the different judges will be mentoring people, just so you've got people to chat to, to make that experience better for you, uh, and then 
someone for whom you can magnify or echo the reforms that you think are important. Question, how will it help uh, if one carries a single role continuously, such as speaking first or second? Oh, excellent, excellent question. So I, for a very long time, uh, was a first speaker. Then I decided that, no, 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 no. In fact, I'm a second speaker. Uh, and first and second are fine. Third is the worst position in the world. I'm terrible at third. I always collapse uh, and die. Uh, and then having done simply sufficiently no-note speeches that my brain finally expanded sufficiently uh, that I could tether together all of the ideas at third, I finally embraced my destiny uh, and became a third speaker. Uh, so I think that um, speaking in different positions is firstly all, like a lot of fun, figuring out the nuances of positions, figuring out the things that are really good. Like it can be awesome to just like have a great prep and then just like steamroll people at first uh, or feel the effect you're having on the debate at second where you can shape it into particular, uh, particular directions or really like closing lots of issues and manipulating the debate in a positive way at third. There are unique, wonderful things about each of the roles that happen with, within debating. Uh, and so if you're not speaking all of those roles, you're just locking yourself out of the joy that can come with, with, with figuring, figuring it out. Um, I also just think it, it massively improves uh, your debating. Uh, it introduces that flexibility. What do I need to do in this debate? Sometimes as, as a third speaker, you need to do a little bit more of what a second speaker traditionally does because oof, you have really miscued this debate and you have to try and miraculously whip up some material that, that is like dubiously present in the earlier speeches. Um, uh, or if you are a, a second speaker, thinking why on earth is my first speaker once again, not done the thing that I particularly asked them to and then learning, wow, they need to be supported this way uh, in prep. Or as a first speaker, having done a second speech, being like, wow, it actually does make my second speaker's job a whole lot easier when I do X, Y, Z thing at first. It just makes you, it makes you an immensely better teammate, um, as well as just giving you the flexible skills necessary to be an exceptional speaker. Um, yeah, so, so for all reasons, joy being a better teammate uh, and the, the, the way that it can improve you uh, as an individual speaker strongly encourage you to experiment with different uh, speaker positions. Also, because you might just find that your natural speaking position is one that you never considered um, uh, and develop it, develop those skills uh, and, and find, a, find, a, find a different preference. Hmm. Now I don't like speaking first. I've changed my mind. Third's great. I'm not good at speaking first anymore. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, I would say that this doesn't necessarily apply within a team. Uh, so if you're going towards a particular tournament and you have a set speaking like, like roles within a team, uh, it is good to speak a lot within those particular roles so that you can generate that vibe with, with individuals. Uh, my feedback is more just like when you have club night uh, at, at, with your society, or if you're doing a practice debate, not in the lead up to any particular tournament, take the opportunity to speak in an unusual position. Uh, especially if you have someone who's very good at that position also in a different position because then you can give them feedback on on what they need to do well to be an excellent third speaker they can give you feedback on what you need to do well as a first speaker uh and so you have that communication of skills which then you can communicate to your first speaker who um is missing one particular particular thing 